Some say we're on the verge of a great awakening. Others claim the powerful Puppet Master's multifaceted stranglehold is stronger than ever. And on the Higher Side Chats, we explore the conspiracies, the mysterious, the alternative, and the occult on a quest that rests firmly on the fringe, which won't be sponsored by Audible or Stamps.com, nor picked up by the gatekeepers of conventional media or radio. It's a quest of the people. So if you enjoyed this first free hour of THC, consider sponsoring the journey yourself by subscribing at thehiresidechatsplus.com. Just $5 a month gets you a second hour with all our great guests on each of our month's five shows. You can also make your own topic and guest suggestions right on your THC Plus profile, communicate with Greg Carlwood, and have your own custom RSS feed URL to use and still listen on the majority of popular podcast applications. You can also support the show with a donation into the THC Money Bomb, where on the last show of every month, we give half of the total donations back to one of the random listeners like you who could use a nice surprise in these troubled times. And lastly, to support THC in a free and equally important way, share the show with your friends, review us where you can, and join us in the conversation on Facebook, Twitter, and our subreddit forum, where THC fans and the cerebral adventurers of the counterculture have taken refuge, and discuss the finer points of our never-ending struggle to tip the scales in favor of truth, peace, and enlightenment in a war-torn, corrupt, and shady world. Let the games begin. In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chats. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. But we're far from 1930, and I deal with a different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Higher Side Chats. All right, party people, how's it going, Higher Side Chatters? Drinking a little drink, smoking a little smoke, as good as I'll ever be from San Diego. I'm Greg Carlwood, and today is another one of those shows that looks at real-world solutions for people who are fed up with the system or are just struggling to find a place in it. I like doing these shows every so often, and the last one in this vein we did was with Greg Paul of the New Earth Nation, and I like that show, but the person who initially told me about New Earth led me to believe they were a little bit further along in their communities then turned out to be the case. The philosophy of New Earth is great, but there's nowhere you can really go today to be a part of it, really. And a lot of people who were interested in those ideas wrote me about that frustration. And it seems like a common thread with these emails is folks that are willing to work towards something bigger than themselves, wanting to get back to the Earth and away from the system, but are still kind of looking for options. They're not really seeing many. And then there was once a long time ago where I tweeted something about wanting to get some THC fans and starting a test city down in Costa Rica and getting the hell out of here. And I got like two dozen responses of people that are like, I'm ready to go right now. But I don't know anything about starting a community. And honestly, there are already communities out there that have THC listeners in them, actually. And that's what today is all about. I know it's fun to talk about the Brotherhood of Saturn and the secret space program, but what are you going to do with that? So to answer back to all the people looking for something, wishing New Earth Nation or the Venus Project or the Zeitgeist Movement was a real thing, people who liked Wendy Tremaine from so many moons ago, you might like this one. Because really, Mardok is right. We're not going to beat the elite into submission, but we can recognize that there are little pockets of sanity, little pockets of community, where people are putting that togetherness philosophy into action and making the decision to live a little differently. So I contacted the Twin Oaks community, and they passed me along to the sister community, Acorn, where I found Belladonna and Marduk. And they'll tell you all about their little community in a way that very few other media outlets allow for. And by the end, if you think that this might be something you want to try, you can totally reach out to either Belladonna or Marduk and let them know you appreciate what they're doing and make your case. And if you can't commit to this type of lifestyle and you still respect it and want to support some of the things they stand for, you can just buy seeds from them and support their community that way with their business that they run. But if more and more people reject the pre-approved consumer-driven dog-eat-dog system and choose to put down the posters and live out their activism, eventually the switch will flip. So just some food for thought before we dive in. Also, before we dive into this, I got another THC-themed piece of bumper music. I've gotten a lot, actually, and a couple that are meant to replace the THC 
Odyssey theme song that are great, but I haven't done anything with them yet because I just keep putting it on the back burner. But I got this one from someone named Apaya who uses turntables built into suitcases that are run off solar panels and use that to make this track. I saw some pictures. I thought it looked pretty sick. So here's a little of that. And we'll be talking egalitarian community living with Belladonna and Mardok, two members of the Acorn community on the other side. Smoking a little smoke. Smoking a little smoke. THC the higher side chest. THC the higher side chest. How weird can you get? 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 THC can get pretty weird. THC can get pretty weird. All right, people, today's going to be an interesting show because every so often we examine one of these organizations or big projects for a new society like the Venus Project or the New Earth Nation, and their flaw is that they're really only conceptual. Even though we know that that first test city is always right around the corner, some people just don't have the time to wait. Sometimes we want to hear about the options that exist right now, and surprisingly, these options aren't on the other side of the globe in some faraway exotic land. In fact, there's probably one pretty close to you. I'm talking about the -the off-the-grid egalitarian community communities springing up all over the Western world because as people consider their lifestyles, their consumption, and the possibilities for collapse, for some, this style of living just seems a bit more appealing. Well, today we're going to talk to two people who live in just such a community called the Acorn Community, which is an offshoot of the well-known Twin Oaks Community, both in rural Virginia State. They're part of a network called the Federation of Egalitarian Communities, or the FEC, with functional communities in Missouri, Seattle, Virginia, Ohio, and a couple other areas in the U.S. And for the next couple hours, they're going to tell us everything we might want to know about this style of living. They're here to tell you that not only is another way of life possible, but it's happening right now. We got Belladonna and Marduk, the sun god himself. Guys, welcome to the show. How the hell are you? Fucking great to be here. Excited to talk to you about uh, something that actually works. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, this is it's really important to me. So I'm excited to talk to you about it, too. Yeah, I mean, thanks for being here, guys. We don't get a lot of opportunities to look in depth at some of these types of communities very often because the mainstream isn't really interested in giving us that option. So I appreciate it a lot. Why don't we start off by you telling us a little bit about yourselves and how you ended up at Acorn? I mean, were there aspects of typical American life that drove you to it? Or is it something that you got from your family? How would you end up living in such an unconventional way? Well, um... I mean, I I honestly found it from the internet. I was uh, in the army at the time when I kind of did my uh, wake up thing and realized that the uh, status quo is not exactly what I want to live in. So uh, my wife and I were researching uh, just just randomly thought, oh, what about that community idea that we heard failed in the 60s? I wonder if any of those are still around. And uh, we we stumbled onto the FEC website and uh, found Acorn and. The rest is history. Yeah, it's it's been really wonderful living here. I've been here about five years now. Wow, that's awesome. And Belladonna, what's your story? Yeah, um, I he- must have heard about a commune from some adult in my life when I was much younger because I never really did too well in school because I was always like analyzing the history books, being like, "Where are the women in here? Like, what what's going on here? This can't be this can't be right." And um, so somebody must have told me what a commune was. So I was telling my mother since I was like 12, I'm going to move to a commune. And she was like, how do you even know what that is? And finally, I joined Occupy and somebody who was in Occupy with me moved to Twin Oaks and I visited Twin Oaks and then just, um, ended up living at Acorn. Right on. So, yeah, you're pretty fresh. I mean, we talked about that in the pre-show, but having heard about it from Occupy is kind of interesting because this is kind of the thing that Occupy seemed like they were trying to set up in a bunch of different areas that weren't really land they owned, but they all seem to get shut down. But are there a lot of similarities be- between Zuccotti Park and what you find at Acorn? Um, I'd say there are definitely some similarities. Um, I'd say it's more, you know, it's more of an insulated group like in occupy anybody could just walk into the general assembly and start raving about anything they wanted (laughs) and here it's like you know we invite people here and if somebody wants to live here long term they have to get accepted for membership so it's it's i'd say it's slightly more organized right on egalitarian isn't really a term that we hear very much i mean what exactly is an egalitarian community what unites the ones in your network 
Well, there's a mission statement from uh, the FEC in general. It just is seven principles that all communities who apply to be, be a part of the FEC um, agree to. And I'll, I'll just go ahead and read it. Number one, it says, holds its land, labor, income, and other resources in common. Number two, assumes responsibility for the needs of its members, receiving the products of their labor and distributing these and all other goods equally or according to need. Practices nonviolence uses a form of decision-making in which members have an equal opportunity to participate either through consensus, direct vote, or right to appeal or overrule, actively works to establish the equality of all people, and does not permit discrimination on the basis of race, class, creed, ethnic origin, age, sex, sexual orientation, or gender, gender identity, acts to conserve natural resources for present and future generations while striving to continually improve ec ecological awareness and practice, creates processes for groups communication and participation, and provides an environment which supports people's development. Well, sounds pretty rational. Yeah, and I think egalitarian means different things to everybody in the community, and that's one of the things that is kind of hard to speak about because it's using collective pronouns is often misleading. And really to kind of understand community in any sort of in-depth way, you'd need to spend a couple of months and ask several people there about what's going on because uh, individuals really bring what ha is happening in a community in existence. The community provides nothing except the space that's there and some basic like structural things around we do want to communicate. We don't want to punch people in the face. <laughs> but beyond that, like whatever sort of business or enterprise the community gets in is all individually driven and uh, personal responsibility based. Yeah. I mean, you ask a question here, you'll get five different answers. <laughs> or 30. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm sure you guys face some criticisms with communal living. I'm sure you hear the dreaded word of communism because it's interesting that our society they want to make us afraid of communal living. They want to make it seem uh, super inconvenient or super strange. Uh, in school, working together is called cheating. But it is the best way to get by. And it is the only way to uh, end the fighting, you know. I mean, we're never going to have a world without war unless every country considers themselves a part of the earth first and part of the human family first. And then you have no one to go to war against. You have no enemies, so to speak. I mean, in school, they never told me what communism was. They just were like, communism is, is evil and it happened in China. So I think that's a huge flaw that we don't even teach kids what communism actually is. Right. Well, and I think, I think the main complaint with communism in general, and especially from people who are into the sort of fringe and are questioning like the society in general, most people end up as anarcho-capitalists or something like that, when in actuality, like, Communism, especially in the form that we have, it's freedom of association. We are also against the authoritarian state in all aspects. So I guess the benefit or the difference between like anarcho-capitalism and, and the sort of egalitarian community that we're trying to, to promote here is the fact that the abundance comes with sharing. So much, of, so much of what people work for and strive for is to keep their own little space their own one bedroom apartment and have their own toaster and their own microwave and their own refrigerator. When if 20 people got together and started living, you would only need one refrigerator and one toaster between them. And all of the excess is, you know, bounty that can be shared between everybody. I mean, the idea that I find the most or I'm the most passionate about is the concept of like uh, open source library sharing. If you're not using a tool, why not let your neighbors use it? Just at a bare minimum. You don't have to like drop out of the system and move to a community in, in the woods. I mean, there are all sorts of models and what works right for you is what is right for you. And visit several of them if, you, if you're interested and you'll find a place that fits what you want. Also, some people I've heard about in cities like getting together with their neighbors and going in on like a bulk food order so that they can pool their resources to get food. It's, I think a big part of it is pooling our resources so that we waste less. I totally agree with you guys. Jacques Fresco is where I got that idea of library sharing of communal goods. And I hadn't really thought of it before then. But when he points out that everybody on the 
in the neighborhood and the subdivision's got a lawnmower that just sits there in the garage 99% of the time and then just gets rolled out once a week, it really did just hit me at how seriously inefficient that is. So I'm really, I'm with you, man. I think the community aspect of the, of sharing goods is way better. It just makes way more sense. Uh, things get used more often. I guess the only criticism, something my girlfriend says, because she's she went to culinary school, she's big into cooking, and she's got a lot of tools in the kitchen that she really likes, you know, she's kind of particular about. And a criticism she brought up is in a community living situation, people might not have the same respect for those tools or, you know, her ownership, I guess, gives her a little bit of a sense of pride to take care of some of that stuff. Do you ever run into problems with people disrespecting the things that are communally given? That is definitely a problem we run into. Um, I, for example, um, Mardok and I are actually both, we cook a lot for the community. And there is this really nice knife that we both use. And I didn't know for a long time that you should oil, walk, clean this knife and then oil it afterwards. Mm. And that's know that I continuously see people not oil this knife and uh, but the, the great thing about living at least in this community is a lot of people seem to be open to criticism about these things so everyone I've spoken to about this knife I've been like please oil that they're like oh oh I didn't know I'll do that now so I think one of the strong things about acorn is that people are open to communicating about mm-hmm. these it's like if there is a problem with the way a tool is being treated a lot of people will listen and I think a lot of it is like picking your battles, so to speak. I am also like, like Bella and I said, uh, I cook a lot. And when I got here, people would wash cast iron with soap and water. And that's just, uh, that's just <laughs> sinful. Yeah. Simple, simple thing. But, uh, but you know, with enough time and I would, I would look after it. And I, I I've been basically telling people if you don't want to, or don't understand how, how to clean a cast iron the way I, I prefer, I would, I would like just, for you to leave it dirty and I'll clean it out with uh, an oil and some uh, scrub brush. There's very little malicious intent that I've come across here, especially I think there's like a filtering system that comes with it being an intentional community is it takes intention. You have to be thinking about yourself and how you want to be in the world to even find a place like this. So I think the, the caliber of people who come here are generally way more mindful than the general population, especially about especially about feedback and wanting to improve oneself. Yeah, I mean, I'd say there are many of the people here like really want feedback and want to hear how they can become, I I don't want to say better people, but improve themselves so that they're happier and they can interact with people in a way where everyone's happier. Yeah, people are definitely open to that here, for sure. It's kind of weird, but on a fundamental level, it's almost like We have to relearn how to interact with people because we do it in this controlled framework and usually one person in most interactions is working for a company so they're getting paid and they have to be nice and it's shallow conversation and we really don't deal with a lot of people that we don't know super well on a regular basis in an intimate setting. Well, I think that individually for me, I've learned so much by living here with the amount of people who come through and I've, I, I pay attention to my actions and, and how people interact with me and how better to communicate with them in, in a sense of not criticizing them. Like I've been trying to remove the word should from my language. And I, so I don't like to say to people, you should do this, or this is what needs to happen in this situation, but more express my feelings and needs in, in the situation so that people want to meet that. It's more about like addressing people in a way that you are not alienating them. Mm -hmm. There's this uh, great thing that we've been as a community trying to work towards. It's called um, nonviolent communication. So it's like, for example, say I had a problem with Marduk because uh, I'll give a really silly example. He kept stepping on my toes instead of being like, you always step on my toes and you're, you're, you know, you're just being terrible and being inconsiderate. Inconsiderate is a judgment. So when I say you're being inconsiderate, he's, he probably won't take that well because I'm assuming he's not considering. So instead, it's like I say like how I feel and how it's affecting me and what I would like to change. Like instead of saying all that, like I'd say, I feel sad and it hurts me that you keep stepping on my toe. Is it possible you could not step on my toe anymore? <laughs> yeah, I mean, language matters. 
Yeah, it seems to work a lot better. Like I've noticed since I've tried to communicate that way or take judgment out of the way I communicate, especially when it comes to emotional things, people have a tendency to listen better. And then I've noticed I like often feel closer to people afterwards. And that's a big reason why I live here is like wanting closer connections with people. Like I felt like I'm from New York City and I felt like even though I lived in a city with like a million people, there was such a disconnect. I felt like I had almost no close relationships. Yeah, I can definitely see that. I was actually wondering how uh, your friends and family outside of the community feel about you guys living there. Well, I um, I don't know. I, I come from a fairly conservative family, mostly. And so I typically just call it a farm, which it is. <laughs> <laughs> a community is such a, a loaded term and people automatically assume cultish nature or like charismatic leader or religious base and all of that is just assumptions that are that are fed to people through the mainstream media to kind of critique this way of life and kind of make it sound impossible and fringe to begin with i mean when i was discussing with my friends before i came here the most common joke i heard was don't drink the kool-aid <laughs> i mean right. that's is that's the level of of understanding that people have about about community is that they automatically assume cult they automatically assume, well, there has to be a leader. And like it, when like some new delivery driver shows up or some courier wants to talk to somebody, they're like, well, well, who's the leader? And I'm like, you're, sp you're speaking to him. I'm right here. I, I, I leave myself. <laughs> you can well, talk yeah, to them there. <laughs> it's funny, but again, that's just because it's the only the only time a community is shown to the people through the mainstream media is when it is a cult, when it's something negative that needs to be broken up. Uh, you never just have them go show up at Twin Oaks and be like, you know, these guys are living in an alternative way and everything's going well. And on to the next story. <laughs> yeah, they don't. Yeah, they don't do that very often. Well, my family is pretty like accepting and like they're both like very artistic people. So I think they just uh, they they're just happy that I'm not hitchhiking and not calling them. Like before I came here, I was like hitchhiking around the country and, you know, would lose my phone and not call them for weeks. So they're just really happy that they can call one number and find out where I am. Um, and I think they're also really happy because I just I just did not fit in in the outside world. Like I had a really hard time figuring out what I was going to do. I couldn't get a job. College didn't work for me. So th they're just happy that I'm happy. I have, I have pretty great parents, actually. I have a lot of friends who just don't get it. They're like, <laughs> why would you do that? Don't you want to make a bunch of money? <laughs> I, so I, I was when I grew up, I thought when I, when I was growing up, I thought I was going to try and be a Broadway actress. And um, People are like, why, why aren't you doing that? I'm like, because I don't want to perform for a bunch of rich people every night. Like, I, I, don't, I don't think that's what theater's about. So I'd rather just, you know, move to a commune and live by my ideals. <laughs> but, um, yeah, some people, some of my friends judge me because of that. But a lot of my friends are from Occupy, so that they understand. Uh, they understand. I think um, one of the things that I really am passionate about as well is the idea of having your life be activism. The concept of like going out into the world and shaking the chains and asking the masters, oh, please do this for us, lining up so that the police can tear gas you. I mean, that just plays into their hand because doing that automatically assumes consent that you are consenting to being governed by them. In which case, I've never signed the Constitution. That's not a valid contract. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, I, I, personal political action is to try to use the least amount of Federal Reserve notes as possible and, you know, make the most friends and live a life that supports me. Because if, if you worry about how the mainstream and how the system and, oh, this story and that story, the terrorists have already won. And the terrorists are in the government currently, and we all know this. And so, yeah, the, the way that I've seen to have the most direct action is with myself and not trying to get into a larger group. And that's what I that's what I like about community is the fact that you still have individuality within it and like more support from your friends to discover what you want to be and do. Yeah. Well said, man. I'm with you there. So. It's the Acorn community is an offshoot of Twin Oaks. Give us a little bit of the history there for people who might not be familiar. 
Um, Twin Oaks has been around since 1967. It was started by this woman named Kat King Cage. She read um, this book, Walden 2, by B.F. Skinner. And it, it's about this community called Walden 2. And it's all, it's like this um, utopian community. And she based a lot of the idea, how she wanted to start it on behaviorism. And she bought this property in Virginia and had like, I think like eight people moved there with her. And within like the first couple of years, most of those people left. And then a bunch of young hippie types moved in and it moved far away from the behaviorist thing. <laughs> and they started a hammocks business and eventually got a tofu business. And now they have part of our, um, our seeds business. And um, it's been going on a long time. <laughs> All right on. And then a Acorn started in 93 with uh, a few people. Uh, actually, Kat Kincaid came over. N neither of us have actually met her uh, because she passed. But Ira is the only founding m member living currently here. And Acorn's been going for 21 years now and been thriving more and more. I would say I've been here for like the last quarter of it. And there there's definitely been a renaissance. The the as far as like money goes, it takes a lot less when people share. Mm -hmm. So we have per capita, if we divide it, divided all of our income, it's like 13000 a year. Wow. But as far as how much abundance we have, we just built a, a very large, beautiful timber framed seed office slash housing. Which we're in right now. Which we're in currently. And unfortunately, we had two fires, but that meant that we had like the need to remodel and so we just remodeled our our kitchen area and our and our main housing there's cooperation from other communities as well that, that help us out but we are still thriving and making money and that's the cool thing about about being here is my interaction with everyday routines i i never pay it pay a bill i i i know we have insurance on the fleet of cars i don't typically drive but somebody pays the bills and interacts with with that which is kind of you know you want to spread that out so that your everyday life, you're, you're not having to, to do these in, interactions and cash things because it kind of weighs heavy, heavily on me. <laughs> it's definitely a nicer quality of life. Like I feel like in the outside world, people have to have like a full-time job to take care of their kids and feed their kids and they never get to see their kids. Here we actually consider um, child care to be part of labor. So like people who have children here can spend a significant portion of their time with their children. Yeah, that's huge. After being here, I would never think of having a child anywhere else but community. Me I mean, because the extended family uh, aspect that happens w with a child, they get exposed to so much more information and interaction earlier on that it, it really you can really see the advancement that happens with, with a child quicker and more trusting of adults and all in all, just like a, a braver individual comes out of community. Yeah, definitely. There's there's more children at Twin Oaks than at Acorn. And they're, they're pretty brilliant, a lot of those kids. I was talking to a 14-year-old the other day, and he's talking to me about how um, the prison system is, is unfair and how much injustice is in it. And I'm just like, are, are you really 14 years old? <laughs> like, and, and this is not an uncommon thing to hear from a kid at Twin Oaks. It's it's pretty impressive, and you know, and they, they get so much love from the adults here. Like we, like I think Mardok said before, everyone here has the intention to create like a beautiful community and want the world to become a a better place. So I mean, if I ever had children, I'd be super happy if all the people around this child had that intention. Well said. So. And when you guys broke off in 93, was there a catalyst for Acorn breaking away? Was there a clash of lifestyles or was it just an opportunity to get a new property? Well, what, what it was is Twin Oaks was starting to fill up and a lot of people wanted to do things differently than Twin Oaks. Twin Oaks has a very written system. Uh, they have like a policy binder that is like, I don't even know how to describe how thick it is. It's like, it's enormous. And I don't think we even really have a policy binder. Like we are a more discussion based community. We have um, a consensus meetings every Sunday. That's how we make decisions. And if we have a policy, it's really only in place if somebody remembers that that's a policy. Um, so and, and one and our main policy is, and everything is up for discussion. Like once, if somebody, if, if, if a policy gets passed and, there needs to be an exception made, and the exception is made if it makes sense to make it. We understand that we are enforcing our own laws. We don't have a police force. 
I, and I don't want to be a cop. So, I mean, I do very little policing around here. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me about the communal decision making, because I experienced this a lot at Occupy camps. And my God, was it annoying trying to get a consensus on the simplest things. How does the process work for you guys? Have you found a way to work around those kind of problems? So usually what happens is people come to a meeting with a proposal and people discuss concerns, questions, and the idea is to sort of try and resolve these concerns. Instead of I get Occupy, I noticed a lot of people would just block things automatically. And I think at Acorn, I've noticed people try to like edit the proposal so it works for everybody. And but we're trying we're trying to do this new thing lately where a proposal gets introduced at one meeting and we discuss it and then we don't make a decision until next week, until the following week. That way people have more of a chance to discuss um, and think. And because sometimes in the past, like we've made a decision and then afterwards I was like, you know, I wasn't really clear on that. I don't know how I feel about the, how that, that decision being passed. So that's like, I'm really happy we're moving in that direction to have more time to process. Yeah, I've, I've so very seldom seen a block actually happen here because people are trying to get along and make this thing work. And so I think at Occupy, I, although I was not like directly involved, I would assume that there'd be some sort of individualistic aggrandizing and just listen to me speak and like the, the sort of attention needs to go to me and I, I'm going to make some noise so that people pay attention to me. And in our case, I mean, it does happen. People people like attention, but for, for the most part, we're trying to cooperate here and have a functional a functional society and home. Mm -hmm. So people don't attack people. I mean, we have a role called the peacekeeper, and I've I've seen twice somebody say, "All right, we need to calm down and let's take some breaths, and then we'll talk about this a little more." Also, also um, what you said before, you asked me about like the differences between Occupy and an Acorn. I would say there's de there's are are way less people with messiah complexes here. Um, <laughs> that was a huge part of Occupy. I actually like have written a bunch of things about chosen oneism, as I call it, because there were so many people at Occupy who thought that they were running the show, they, and they would just talk and talk and talk and didn't really care what anybody else thought. Right. And, you know, like Marcus, that's not the case here. <laughs> yeah, that was a huge problem for the one here in San Diego, and I just stopped being interested because I'm like, all right, if you're going to run this thing, then you just go run it, and I'm just going to go home. This tent is getting old anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I guess with uh, you mentioned the Twin Oaks regulation book, and I guess that just with lots of people and many years at this, it just you end up with a lot of regulation, I suppose. But I guess there's over a hundred, almost over a hundred people living there at at, uh, at Twin Oaks. A hundred, I think, say about a hundred. Right on. And I think here, we have about twenty eight members here currently. Yeah, twenty eight. taken. Yeah. Obviously, I've done my research and I knew that that number was about 28, but it did surprise me when I came across it. I expected it to be much bigger. I, I, under 30 people, it seems like a lot of work to maintain farms and all your energy needs and all that stuff with so few people. Do you have any struggles with that? It is definitely a lot. I'd say there's like one or two people who are like pretty much running every area. At least that's from my perspective. Um, and I, we've talked about like growing before, but I think one of the concerns about that is how we'll be able to keep doing consensus because it is a lot, even with 28 people. Um, and there, there are definitely ways to change the process a little bit while still doing consensus with more people. But I also think it would just change the way the community is. Like at Twin Oaks, there are people there who just like, some people just don't talk to each other. It's very easy to avoid people at Twin Oaks. It is, it is not easy to avoid someone here. Like I see everybody here on a daily basis. Yeah. And I think a lot of what makes Acorn uh, a healthy environment to be in is uh, a process we call uh, clearnesses, which is basically like a mandatory conversation with everybody once a year. In the first year you're here while you're applying for membership, uh, the, the membership like, like interim time is like one year, uh, you have four different clearnesses uh, and basically uh, four month intervals. And then after that, it's once a year. And so like if there is something like creeping into your relationship with somebody, there is that outlet of being like, and let's talk about this in depth. Because I think part of, part of what different 
differentiates ACORN from other uh, egalitarian communities is we have an inbuilt process for interpersonal work, meaning that it's part of community. We, we consider that labor creditable, whatever that means. Like <laughs> we, we, we consider it worthwhile to talk to each other and work out our differences. And there is a, a, an emphasis placed on that so that it actually happens and people don't just stew on things for years. And then when somebody says something and I have an, an immediate, immediate like emotional response in a meeting, I, I try to step back and say, is that something personal that's happening between me and them? Is it actually about this, what they're talking about at all? Or is it th- there an underlying issue behind it? And, and I, I've, I found oftentimes it's just, yeah, it's a lot of projection. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I've kind of made it part of like my regular life, even if I don't have to have an official clearness with someone. If I sense there's a problem, I will be like, hey, can we, you know, go sit outside for a minute and get clear on this? I think that's something I hear a lot, actually. People saying to each other, can I, can I get clear with you on something? And I think that that's a huge part of our culture. And it, it definitely helps with like, I, fe- I feel a lot of closeness to the people who live at Acorn. I do feel like it's like these people who live here are more of my family than my extended family. For sure. And I think part of it comes from that clearness process, like having deep conversations, interpersonal stuff as often as we do. So let me have you guys tell the people a little bit about your typical day or maybe week if it's easier, if you don't do the same routine every day. I mean, what do you spend your time doing? How much time is spent doing the lead work to keep the community going versus just hanging out and that kind of thing? Well, I, I do a significant portion of hanging out and that kind of thing. I would say more so than <laughs> my pr- previous life. Uh, got way better at the guitar, uh, yeah. way better at conversation. We do not have like a TV broadcast system here. So occasionally we have a projector, so we watch a movie occasionally, but that's not really in our, in our culture to, uh, to soak up TV. Uh, and that, that gives a lot of extra time. Also, there's, there's no commute and we have uh, a quota, which is tw- uh, 42 hours a week. And that is, we don't do any tracking of labor, so you don't have to like write down the hours you do. It's just a general understanding of try to do this many hours. And the things that are labor creditable are basically anything that benefits more than just yourself. Cleaning your own room, not labor creditable. Cleaning a common space is labor creditable. And my, my typical day, I, I do a lot of domestic stuff. Like I will cook dinner three to five times a week, depending on who's interested in cooking dinner. Same. (laughs) And I do a lot of dishes. I also do office work. I answer the phone. If you call Southern Exposure, you'll probably talk to Belladonna or myself. (laughs) (laughs) We have a lot of the same (laughs) jobs. Yeah, and I think, yeah, we we do have a lot of the same jobs. And what is really an an amazing thing that, that I've found is we, we had a very stressful winter because we were displaced out of our main kitchen and Belladonna and I were overlapping in so much of what we were doing that we were kind of stepping on each other's toes in ways. And it <laughs> festered for a while and we actually just said, you, you know what, let's fucking talk about it and really break it down. And it's it's really strengthened our relationship and we've I think we've both grown from it. I, I definitely, I agree, I agree. But, I've become a better cook because of it too. <laughs> I, I, I really that good when I first came here, and I think I think I'm all right now. But Marduk has given me quite a few tips, and it's it's been very helpful. And I don't I think if we had not decided to talk about it, it would it wouldn't have happened. Right on. Yeah, I mean, people hear that number 42 hours, and they're like, oh, well, this is a regular job. But a lot of times, people have to clean the house and make food and do chores on top of 40 hours a week. So a lot of times, the things you're doing, because you're part of the community, are benefiting you as well, just as your normal chores would. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I cook I cook every, uh, meals for everybody. So whatever you want to do, nine times out of 10 or more, I I don't know the percentage because we don't actually have like assigned labor here. So sometimes things fall through the cracks, but there's two meals a day and you don't have to cook them. And that wastes less food also. I think for like five different families to cook dinner, you you waste a lot of food because it's pretty hard to cook a half a cup of rice. Like you gotta cook (laughs) like at least three cups and that, that could feed quite a few people. So yeah, I think we definitely waste a lot less by cooking for everybody. Yeah, I think the numbers I saw were less than $1,200 a year we're 
feeding 30 people. And that, that number wow. 30 is like, the, the, the number 30 is like very uh, nebulous and it's hard to track because we have so many people like we have a, a regular visitor period that comes through with like four or five people we have summer interns who are just like interested in staying and a lot of times they come here just to try it out and end up saying oh actually i don't want to go back to college and then they stay and live here uh so yeah we're feeding a lot more than that i would say any given meal 40 50 people and we're doing that on less than 1200 dollars a year for 30 people. Yeah, and we also grow <laughs> some of our own food. Also, yeah. like last yeah. night, we had actually some bands come through and we had like 12 extra people. And I just cut up some veggies and made soup. And that was all of it was from our garden. <laughs> That's cool. And on the subject of uh, college, you know, one quote I heard in one of the interviews I listened to by one of the founding members made a pretty good point about the skills you learn in this type of system and that instead of spending tens of thousands of dollars on college, you could join a community like Acorn for four years after high school and you'd learn hands-on farming and agriculture, how to survive without a lot of the modern amenities, how to come to an agreement and work with people. So you can actually have that experience and come out with a ton of practical knowledge compared to a lot of the majors that are out there. And I thought that made a lot of sense. And also, I mean, if I ever, I don't think I, I don't plan on leaving here for a while, but if I did leave, I would have some incredible references and I could put on my resume that I was a man, a co-manager of a big, a big company, <laughs> but I don't be doing that anytime soon. <laughs> I hope I never have to. It's an interesting aspect because I think a lot of people, one of the reservations might be, uh, how am I going to explain this gap on my resume? You know, if I extract from the system and do something like this, there's a lot of fear that you can't get back in once you're out. But that's a great point. Maybe it's actually a plus for the resume. I mean, it, it really depends. There are people who come in for a, a brief period of time and it just doesn't work for them and then they move on. So if they call for a reference, whatever they did most, you could just say I'm, I was the manager of it or, or you know, co-owner of it because... That is what you were doing. You were stepping up to the plate in that sort of, of task that, that you wanted to pursue. I mean, I would say, yes, I'm, I was a kitchen manager and whatever. You know, you can, you can make up any story you want. <laughs> I mean, references, references, that's no one really checks those. Really? Uh, <laughs> There's a gray area there. <laughs> I would rather be homeless at this point. Like, I've seen, I mean, a lot of my friends just bike across the country and we have so many people rolling through here and it's an accessible place for a short period of time, especially when you're really interested in being here. That That's one of the sort of selecting factors that I make when I, uh, people come through is how much do I sense how, how much do they want to be here? How much do they really want to be here versus needing the place? We call this the, uh, the spaceship versus lifeboat. <laughs> um, when people apply for membership or apply living here, it's like, do we, like, are they going to take us to the moon or do they just really need us? Like, do we, do we need to save them with a lifeboat? Right. Like some yeah. people come and it's very clear. Um, somebody who lives here calls it juiced. They're not juiced about the community. They just are looking to get away from something. <laughs> and then we've got people who are like, oh, this is so exciting. We're growing our own food and we're raising our own animals. And, you know, we're, this is, you know, we're not treating them terribly like the factory farms. We're all living together and talking and they're super excited about it. And that's the kind of people we want here. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the community businesses that you've mentioned. I mean, I know you guys have the online seed business and Twin Oaks you mentioned had or has a hammock business. But I mean, if people aren't willing to make the commitment to live this way, they can at least support its existence from their comfortable air conditioned living room by picking up products from these communities, at least. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, our main business is Southern Exposure Seed Exchange dot com. And we sell open pollinated and most uh, mostly organic and uh, heirloom varieties. I'm sitting in a room right now with like probably a quarter ton of, of seeds. Yeah, we got some contender beans going on <laughs> over here. <laughs> but yeah, and and we grow some some portion of the seeds here, and we have a network of of farmers that that grow for us. Uh, I think one of the the boons of like buying directly from us is when you can get a hold of it uh, of us. We we try to provide like very good customer service and. I've made some really good friends just talking on the phone and like the people who call in, we have really good customers and I, I feel very lucky because I've, I've done customer services like 
in the emergency room working at a hospital and that is way worse than trying to tell somebody how to how to grow lettuce <laughs> yeah I mean, I mean sometimes it's really fun people call and they're like I, you know, really don't want to buy the, uh, you know, the GMO food. I don't, I want to, I want to start my own organic farm. What could I start with? What's not too difficult? And I set them up with like some greens and some carrots. And it's like, it's really exciting for me to like hear about people who are like moving in the direction of trying to grow their own food. Just to like know that that's where the world is headed is very exciting to me. Yeah. Like we really started like as Southern Exposure like doubling our, we doubled our business, I think three years, four years in a row, and then have been growing every year since. Uh, and we started doing that in 2008 when other businesses were collapsing. People were like, oh man, I need to start growing my own food because that's like, that is growing money. If you're spending money on trash food at a grocery store, why not spend a $2 and 50 cents and get 60 tomato plants instead of $2 and 50 cents in one tomato. And, it, and, it's also, <laughs> and it's also really great for um, people who are starting farms because we actually do, um, we take new growers on all the time. So if, people, if anybody out there has a farm and they're trying to, you know, make some money or they need help, um, we, we do, we are looking for growers actively. So you can call us up and talk to our person who manages our growers. You can try growing seed for us. So I mean, right on eating fresh, organic, non GMO foods on a daily basis is definitely something a lot of people would like to do these days. They wish they could do, but it's very hard in this culture to make that a priority. You know, I mean, it seems to be like one of the pillars of your whole community. And that, that just kind of boggles my mind, especially at this point, like so far removed from buying like Chef Boyardee in a can <laughs> is the fact that putting something in your body is the most important thing. Why would you put trash there? It makes no <laughs> sense. I don't know. I mean, that's more intimate than sex to me. I mean, because it goes through your whole body. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I should start thinking about it that way every time I'm tempted to go through a drive through because I do that every day. I'm like, oh, I, I suddenly feel that I'm hungry and I'm like, OK, how can I take care of this right now? Well, uh, you know, there's either Chipotle or there's Carl's Jr. And, and then tomorrow I'm going to have a little bit more foresight about this. And I've been saying this for about five years now. And I guess snack, snack and junk food for like my typical junk food is uh, an egg, egg and tomato sandwich on bread that I cooked myself, all heirloom varieties of tomatoes and eggs from our farm. And I mean, I, I couldn't even like imagine like putting a price on how much it costs to buy or, organic at, on the outside yes. versus doing it yourself. Right. It, it makes no sense. And the, the idea of like having a lawn and then buying organic food just like boggles my imagination. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think that a lot of um, uh, land is being wasted. I have this idea that I think New York, they should make Central Park a giant community garden. Yeah. I wish they would do that. Or like make so, – like there's all these like random islands off of New York City. They could make them into vertical farming towers. I don't know. I have like all these ideas about how the world could move towards organic food that is free. I think that it's ridiculous that people have to spend money to buy food actually. Oh, I totally agree with you. And uh, the, I mean, the budgets of these cities are huge. It's It really is ridiculous. When I used to work at uh, Sunglass Hut, I'd stand there on the corner in La Jolla, California, which is one of the highest real estate markets. It's a really nice area. And I'd see these guys come through a couple times a week, these hanging baskets that are on lamp posts and they're flowers. And they come by and they water them. And then every four months or so the plants are dead because it's not really a good environment for them anyway so they change the plants out and I'm like wow you already have the infrastructure you're already paying people to come by and maintain these plants they're just growing useless plants you know if they were to be growing strawberries or blueberries or something I mean this homeless guy who's sitting at this very same corner every week might not die on the street you know it makes so much sense yeah I mean and if we're gonna exist in this system where everybody has to like work work to make money to survive i thought it would be interesting if maybe like in central park or any city they a park was made into a community garden and homeless people are allowed to do that um, you know they can just work in this garden and then have their own food from that and then develop skills because there are farms all over the place that would hire them if they have gardening skills 
No, yeah, you're right. That's another great idea, too. So do, when you guys work for the, you know, the seed business or something, does all that money go into the community pot or do you get some of your own money for things you might want to buy that the community might not care about? Uh, we have a $75 a month uh, stipend, which is personal expense. If, if you do want to buy a bag of Doritos or a case <laughs> of beer, you're more than welcome to do that with, with that money. And I, I guess the majority of the money elsewise is spent through community decisions. Healthcare is provided after six months. Uh, the FEC has this awesome thing, which uh, all of the FEC communities pay into, which is called the name is called Peach, and anything over five thousand uh, dollars, ninety percent of it is covered by Peach. So we have our own kind of network of yeah, an, an insurance company that basically works for us, and we can make loans from it and intersperse the the excess because there's always excess to actually have a, an organization that helps people out medically and also uses that money instead of going for investment capitalist ideas of like investing in community, which is something that we all are passionate about. And that's one of the core things that kind of unites the FEC is the idea of of spreading community however possible and we'll put labor and resources in doing it. With, it, with existing con conditions, it's kind of it's kind of hard, I guess, to get in. Um, and, and it depends on the condition and the, the person in general. I, I've definitely seen people who uh, were excited to be here and seemed like it might not work because unfortunately we're, we are not like that accessible we are very much a farm so if you have mobility issues it can be very difficult it's more like as as people grow older uh there, there are facilities for that i guess yeah there, yeah i mean i think there's also um they built like a new like it's like a hospice kind of area at Twin Oaks, and um, I imagine that if something happened to an A-corner, they probably would be permitted to stay there. I, I can't imagine why not. All right on. I was going to ask you a little bit more about jobs, because one rule I saw on your uh, website is that even if you're willing to share your income, you're not really allowed to have an outside job. I was kind of curious why that was. That, uh, that, that's not true. Um, I've oh. seen people... There was someone who lived here who had a nursing job, and I think they gave a certain percentage of it to the community, and that counted as their labor. Oh, right on. I think that was something I heard Ira say, but it might have been an old video, but I was worried that if I wanted to join Acorn, I'd have to quit the show. Oh, no. Oh, please come visit. <laughs> come visit any time. Uh, yeah, uh, there's, there, there's many people who do uh, different like outside stuff. After you meet the the forty two hours quota, any labor you want to do, all of the the proceeds are yours, and no one's trying to control what you want to do as long as you're not being an asshole with your money and saying, oh, "Look how much money I have versus how little you have." There 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 are people here with trust funds. I mean, so people come from all sorts of different backgrounds. Some from poverty, some from like extreme wealth, and all intermingle and try to knock down the class barrier even though a after we step away i i will be poor and somebody will still have a trust fund i, I don't hold that against <laughs> right right <laughs> well you know being a conspiracy show we hear about a lot of suppressed technologies this is something i wanted to ask you about because you guys got a lot of time do you ever pursue any exotic energy methods uh there there have been some uh there's a project that's happening now with uh veggie oil We've been we've been stockpiling veggie oil for a while and uh, have designs on getting a generator to basically sell back to the grid because uh, we are still plugged in like in the grid in the sense of uh, of electricity. So if we could run a, some sort of engine off of veggie oil that we get for free to pay for our energy needs, that would be great. <laughs> There's and, also oh, go ahead. There's talk of um, eventually building an off the grid re residence that like runs off of solar panels or something. There's been talk about, yeah, building a new building like that. Yeah, we have several like dark green buildings currently, like buildings that aren't hooked up to plumbing or electricity. And so therefore they're off the grid because there's there's no footprint other than an extension cord maybe. <laughs> How's your uh, plumbing? Do you, are you on city plumbing or are you on well? Luckily we're on well water, so our, our water is not fluoridated, which is... 
which is beautiful. Uh, <laughs> Keeps your third eye nice and clean. <laughs> <laughs> I was think I was just thinking that. So, do you guys use a lot of solar, even if you're not totally sufficient on it? Twin Oaks has a solar panel array that um, they are doing something similar with, of like selling back or well, utilizing it, and, and then if there's an excess selling back, they, it's like a grid tied so- solar array. Personally, I think we're we're overcast here in Virginia a little more than what is helpful with solar. I guess personally, I, I think that although electricity is nice, and if some of those alternative energy things actually pan out or get released into the public, I would I would love to do it. But honestly, living without electricity is not that hard. I and mean, I've I've done it in different homesteading like community settings for a while and. It was very rewarding. I read more books than I ever have before, and, and expanded my knowledge that way. The only problem would be um, running if, if would be running our business because a lot of it is through the internet, so we would need to have like, electricity. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, I, I know you guys are obviously happy there, and there are a ton of great aspects to communal living. But is there anything you do feel like you miss out on? I, I miss out on advertising. <laughs> <laughs> um. Pop cultural references I don't get all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I miss street performers. That's like the main thing I miss. I miss just like, I miss talking to homeless people actually. Like just like getting to, I, I miss wandering streets and talking to strangers <laughs> and finding out their stories. I miss that. I, I, I miss traveling, but I can, I can still do that here. If I, you know, take some time off, I'm allowed to do that. Like I said before, like I wanted to be an actress. I, I miss those like opportunities to act, but I don't like, what it's feeding into. If I were to audition for a lot of things, I don't like who would be getting that money and a lot, a lot of the corruptness in there and how, how superficial that all is. I don't like, I don't like that. So I, I miss those opportunities, but there's plenty of opportunities to make theater and art here. So I like that. Are there any other aspects of the community that you like that maybe we haven't touched on or might not be as obvious to people? Yeah, the the use of like waste stream, there's kind of a very large dumpster culture here. And there's an enormous percentage of food that's thrown away. I, I don't necessarily trust statistics, but I've heard over half of the world's food supply is thrown away. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things that we do at Acorn, uh, not only like networking with different food companies, food delivery services. Every Monday we get a giant cargo van full of food. We, we've gotten cases of avocados. I'm eating one right now. <laughs> cases of avocados for free that would have ended up in the dumpster had we not taken them. And whatever sorts of food, just amazing food that got thrown away because of a bureaucratic expiration date and like reclaiming that and like putting it through your body instead of wrapped in individual pieces of plastic and ending up as compost in individual pieces of plastic in a landfill somewhere. And we also have tried to donate some of it to like food not bombs in the area, but they already have too much. (laughs) There is so much food being thrown out. Wow. Yeah, that is such an awesome aspect of it because I say this all the time and it drives me nuts, but you got homeless people standing outside in front begging for food Meanwhile, you know, they're in front of a building that is stocked to the brim with food and they've got a locked dumpster out back where they're throwing out the ex- excess food. And it's like, if you just went out the other door, you could give it to this guy, but then that wouldn't be fair because he didn't pay for it. And in capitalism, if you know, everything's got to be on an even keel, it, it's just, it is really sad, but that is an interesting aspect of the community. I like what you guys do there. Equality means something different for everybody, different things for different people. Like that guy might have like a a problem that prevents him from working. So it just, I I guess it just drives me crazy when people are like, oh, well, they don't work. They, (laughs) they, they can't get food. It's like, well, maybe, maybe they can't work in the way you want them to. Right. I mean, I always also say with unemployment as high as it is, I mean, on, in one aspect, isn't that a, a good thing. I mean, we've just run out of shit to, that has to get done. You know, isn't that what jobs are supposed to be is, is tasks that need to be carried out and we're catching up to those things. So shouldn't it be good that we're relieving people? But obviously in this system, that means you can't eat. Yeah. A lot of things need to change. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the idea of you have to provide for yourself. The thing is, is there's so much abundance coming from, from the system now all it takes is people sharing and everybody would get their needs net 
met easily and quickly and could be could be tomorrow the thing about the whole idea of revolution that leaves a bad taste in my mouth is the idea that we're playing into their hands the concept that that we're going to out violence the violent coercive people makes no sense no we're going to be i guess my favorite banner is if i'm to fight under one banner it's friends in love Let's just be friends and love and share what we have nice because couple. there's they well I mean there's so much there's so much abundance in the world and so much so many starving people just because people lock their dumpsters because to keep the system going. Mm-hmm. If people believe that um if we don't go with the GMO Monsanto thing that we're gonna run out of food I think that is just a myth. That is a myth. Right. The only way you can get people to act so selfish and miserly is if they really do think that they might not have food tomorrow. They got to really believe this lie about scarcity. I mean, another interesting anecdote about abundance that I've probably said three or four times in the show before, but it's just like such a crazy thing to think about is I know someone who adopted some kids from an impoverished country and when they took these kids, you know, like four years old and six years old to their first grocery store, they just broke down crying because they could not believe that there would just be a room filled with food like this where you can just go and pick whatever you want. Meanwhile, in the back of their head, they're thinking of everyone they've ever known who's just suffering and starving. And it's got to be it's got to be tough to think, man, I'm in a place now of infinite resources, near infinite resources. And meanwhile, everyone I've ever known in this previous land is is suffering. It sucks. That does suck. <laughs> well, and it's I think it's by design. I don't know. I think I think there's a lot of like manipulation in the sense of controlling people's minds to think that they need to stockpile because there is some fictitious scarcity and like the whole idea of overpopulation and we're outstripping our resources and this and that we're only outstripping our resources because we're throwing 90 percent of it in the dumpster planned obsolescence this this whole idea of consumerism for consumer goods it is killing the planet obviously and it is getting nowhere quickly helping Mm -hmm. one obviously destructive to the world and to everybody who's trying to call this place their home and yet people just continue on with it because there is no like alternative given to them instead of just like figuring out oh shit gets thrown away for no reason at all Mm -hmm. yeah planned obsolescence is such a thorn in my paw man i that really i hate it there's a movie called the light bulb conspiracy that focuses solely on planned obsolescence and it's called the light bulb conspiracy because they've got light bulbs in certain buildings there's one in a fire station they've been going for decades you know they they don't run out the the point is is that these companies who made light bulbs had to make them expire had to make them more fragile because otherwise they'd be out of business they'd sell everyone five light bulbs and they'd be gone but the technology is there how inefficient is it that we just make them to break down so that the cycle can keep going yeah my uh, my partner buys a lot of the uh, computer parts here and he was saying oh well, if we get that one, it's going to expire about a week after the warranty runs out. Yep. And like that's, he said that's the case with most of the parts. <laughs> I was telling you guys that I just had to get a new hard drive, and I don't ever pay attention to things like warranties because I don't keep that kind of paperwork, and I'm just like, whatever. But uh, when I went to buy a new one, I noticed on the box, the warranty is two years. I've had it for about two and a half years. How funny that it now doesn't work. And it's like in a system of capitalism, and it always bothers me, you'll have a lot of people who are libertarians who say, oh, it's the state or it's capitalism, you know, what's the real enemy? And they always want to put all the problems on the state. And of course, the state's responsible for a lot. But in capitalism, how do you get rid of planned obsolescence? How do you trust that a product is is working? How do you trust the guy who's selling it to you, who's relying on your purchase to live? He can't be 100% honest. He can't tell you that he's actually got only the third best product in town. If you really want a deal, go down here. Even if he knows that, he cannot tell you. Uh, it goes against his own self-interest. And all these things seem small, but when you you stack them up and you build your entire society around them they eat away at what could be a paradise yeah i think the uh the, the whole idea of like abstracting resources into into money to begin with 
And like the whole libertarian ideal of the market is go going to save us. This this market that never existed, they admit <laughs> that there's never been a free market. But if a free market happened, then the market would save us. I mean, Stephen Molyneux do, does this all of the time, of this idealistic market that somehow exists. And people trade things and get what they want, and that's great. But the idea of inches building inches building a house versus wood building a house and the concept of oh well you don't have any money oh well you ran out of inches it's the same sort of correlation and yeah it's <laughs> it's frustrating man i get it <laughs> putting money and making mo money is more valuable than the stuff we actually need in the society that that exists it's it's ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny that you bring up stefan monoyu because i like a lot of the stuff he says but yes he is he will not let it go about the free market and how capitalism is not the problem and he actually had a debate with peter joseph of the zeitgeist movement and one point peter joseph brought up that i thought was a great example is, you know, imagine you got two guys who have pizza places, you know, in, in Stefan Montague's perfect world, two guys have pizza places that are competing. One of them knows he makes a hundred grand a year and he's happy with it, but he knows that if he's willing to burn down the other guy's pizza place or let rats loose in his business or poison his ingredients, he can make more money. And that temptation is always there. And so now you have a system where the people who are willing to carry out that temptation, the people who are willing to stamp out their competition no matter what in a moralless way those people as long as they get away with it will rise to the top and look at the corporations that are on the top of their game today they're the most cutthroat bloodthirsty corporations they definitely are the most moralist corporations and it only makes sense with this system like how do you weed that out and keep capitalism you can't do it yeah, competition is a sin. That that is something that is that has been said by by many of I guess what I would consider oligarchs now in in the in the elitist system of, of the the corporation. Yeah, it's competition is what they're trying to stamp out, and they will. I guess the thing that I was trying to to say is that if value exists, it is valuable because we're using it, not because we're setting on it. The idea that gold-based currency is going to save us from something if we're all storing gold under our bed, then that will make the system more secure than the current like fiat currency we have now. It's, it's bullshit. Gold can be useful if you're making rings out of it or connectors for actual like circuit boards or whatever you make with gold. If you're using it, then it is useful and valuable. But the idea of an inherent value that one can place that is judged by this fictitious market is just completely asinine. Well said. So how, we're getting kind of close to the end of it. How do you guys handle visitors? Obviously, people can't just show up whenever they like. This isn't Silver Dollar City or something. Do people have to make an appointment? If somebody wants to visit the community, they should uh, go on our website, and they, uh, which is acorncommunity.org. Yeah. Um, they go on in their list of questions, it send, send an email to the email that's provided on there, and then they will, you know, have a conversation with the person, who, people who work on the visitor team, and then um, they have to have, like, a, a phone interview, and then if that all goes well, they get set up with a visitor period. Yeah, it's basically just, just write us an email and express why you want to be here and let us know your intent and if it seems like it matches up or or not even i mean we're not we're not super selective about who comes through here there's this common misconception that there are so many dangerous people in the world i i think that it's complete bullshit <laughs> the majority of the people in the world are nice and well intending they just don't know any better right when people come here and see the abundance we have and the way in which we are interacting it takes a very, yeah, it would be take a very pathological sort of mind to not see that and respond in a mean, take advantage sort of way. I mean, we don't lock our doors. Typically, when we drive our cars around, we leave the keys in the front seat and the door is unlocked. We're not trying to build a security culture here because security is an illusion. Security is just control. Security is the idea that that you can actually lock down your environment when in actuality, it's closer to it's closer to chaos than, yeah. than actual any sort of control you put on it. 
I'd say the <laughs> primary thing we look for in emails from people looking to visit are how excited they are about the idea or like, like, are they interested in anything? Like sometimes we get these emails where people are just like, yeah, I like to, um, I want to get out of the rat race. <laughs> yeah, like I want. Well, if somebody said that with a bunch of other stuff, I'd probably be like, "Cool," but right. like some people, you know, like I'm. I like um, video games. I, I don't really like to read. Um, I don't. Um, and like I don't know. You you can just tell by looking at somebody's letter if they're not quote unquote juiced. And mm-hmm. also, we, I would say we do look to see if someone is like super super like off their rocker going to cause problems. And that, I think that's why we have the phone interview. Because it's, it's, it's pretty easy to tell. Like I, I've done phone interviews in the first like five seconds. I, I can usually tell if someone is going to be fine. To yeah, it's com- or it's completely unstable. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Well, for folks who might be thinking about an even higher level of commitment, you guys do have an internship program, right? Um, we're, we've been kind of changing that a little bit to the, where we, we, would, we want people to come for a three week visit. And then if they want to be an intern, they ask the group if they can be an intern. Right on. It's, it's very, I mean, people come for two day visits. It's, it, it's approachable in the sense that when, when you make contact with us, somebody will contact you back. There's a lot of people who just are like, yeah, I kind of want to do this thing and send out one email and just don't reply. I mean, and so with that, you, you know, there's no, it is basically self-selecting in that sense. And there, there's very little like filtering that happens other than obvious people who are not willing to even write a couple of emails, <laughs> not being able to but hear. Occasionally right. though, we do people show up and we have to ask them to leave while they're here. Sometimes, sometimes they seem unstable or sometimes we get people who, show up and then just like it's like very obvious they just showed up and smoked cigarettes for a week <laughs> like that's fine they can smoke as many cigarettes as they want as long as they're doing other stuff yeah like i mean like us, but what i always tell visitors is i think it's like weird when visitors show up and don't do anything because like if you were to like go to your aunt's house for two days you might like offer to wash the dishes like <laughs> i guess i just find it like, i guess like a lot of people show up who don't have like any sense like that they just show up and just sit around and think it's just like a giant party right and that that's like the biggest problem we run into with visitors and people just like don't get it like that we're like like this is like a giant project we're running here. <laughs> yeah don't be rude i mean you're a guest in someone's home really yeah and then yeah like yeah exactly we're, we're and i like most people come through i would love for them to be part of that home if they want to be and then they kind of got to show that they're into it i mean <laughs> yeah so you guys are pretty flexible as long as people use a lot of exclamation points in their communication. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Too many exclamation points. That might get you filled Right. Out. Not yeah. too many. Not too many. Person if, you, if you wrote in all caps and exclamation points, that, that, <laughs> might, that might fill you up. No, it, it's just more like, like, I think if anybody like, was honestly interested in living in community and wrote us a letter, it would be very clear from that letter. <laughs> It would just come out naturally, I think. Right. Well, hey, I really appreciate it, guys. I think this has been a lot of fun. Uh, Before we go, do you want to plug the business again a little bit and remind people how they can support the community financially if they don't want to visit? Yeah, it's Southern Exposure. I think our website. SouthernExposure.com is the website. Uh, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange will get you there from Google. Uh, we have over 500 varieties of vegetable seeds, mostly heirloom and organic. We have about 200 varieties or close to of tomato seeds alone. So, uh, And we have a bunch of people who are really passionate about gardening. And if you have gardening questions, we can help you out. We also have an amazing catalog. You can just sign up for that. It's a free catalog and it's chocked full of gardening advice isolation distances if you want to save seed and like times for planting and descriptions of varieties and like disease resistance it's it's a very great resource that alone i I really feel great about i mean just write us and get us our catalog call us up hit hit the email and get our catalog for free and then see which see what you think i mean we, we we do put a lot of a lot of time and effort in our catalog and it has many resources in it also, if you call us up, you might get Marduk or or I. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'd be happy to help anyone figure out like how to start a garden. Also, if people already have a farm and want you know need some support, call us up also because we are always looking for growers. So that's nice. an important thing to put up. Awesome. 
Well, outside of the plugs, I mean, before I let you guys go, is there anything else you wanted to leave the people with? Any parting words? I just, I just want to reiterate that there is an abundance in sharing. Like, it, the more you share, the more abundance there is. And that, that really is, like, one of the greatest lessons I've ever learned is sharing with friends, you get more. I agree. Share your resources. And I think that, I think that's, like, going to play a huge role in, like, changing the way the, the world is right now. The more people share. The more people share their resources. Right on. I'm with you guys. Well, Belladonna, Marduk, it has been a pleasure. Hopefully I can come out there and visit you guys sometime if I'm ever in Virginia. But yeah, anytime. Until then, take care of yourself, guys. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Great to talk to you, Greg. And uh, I really appreciate what you do. Uh, your show is amazing. <laughs> Me too. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Also, empathy and compassion. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there we go, guys. Two great people who are doing their part to make sure the system they're supporting is one they believe in. This might not have been one for everybody. Some of these things might have seemed kind of obvious or like common sense, but honestly, we've been damaged as a people, and we have some fundamental stuff to work out still. And I'm sure a decent percentage of you are staring down at your license plate renewal or your ridiculous electric bill or the stupid name badge hanging off your rearview mirror or around your neck right now and thinking, fuck all this, this ain't fun. I'm spinning my wheels and I don't know why and I need to try something different and connect with like-minded people along the way. And this show gave you an outlet for that. Next week, we're diving back into the world of weird and looking at the ancient story of the Anunnaki with a new twist with our guest Gerald Clark, and he'll explain why it seems most likely that the ancient engineers of humanity are probably still pulling the strings today. It's a good one, and in the meantime, live long and prosper, and instead of wondering if there's a heaven, let's fucking make one right here. And to close this out is a track by one of today's guests, Mardok himself, with a song called Fucking Nothing, which is what you got to lose. And with that, it's your move, capitalist corporations of extreme waste and psychopathic CEOs of the impending apocalypse. Your fucking move. Darling, I'm too old looking in the market She's gotta keep her belly fed She says she's sick of sleeping on a stick shift Oh, that's the only place to go So, please excuse me, dear I do not wanna talk yeah, Please excuse me, dear I do not want to talk You seem to Forget just who you are And what you did So let me tell you One more time You broke my heart You seem to Forget just who and what you did to let me tell you one more time You broke my heart and I don't know how you're living with yourself You've always been mean at making sense, but also good at it. Your cadence, crisp and logic arguments, you caught me quick. I'm sorry for all the fucking nothing. That you got For all the fucking nothing That you got from me I'm not here to settle debts I know exactly what I did And exactly what I deserve Settled debts, I know exactly what I did and exactly what I 
that is a friend And we both know that life is never fair Nothing is ever fair